It's 2025 and the data world is already off to a whirlwind of a start. I mean, look at last year. Uh, we saw Databricks get one of the largest funding rounds ever, along with OpenAI. They also purchased Tabular for over a billion dollars. OpenAI bought Rockset. Boomi at the very end came in and acquired uh, Rivery. I mean, these deals were done way before they announced them, but again, they all happened last year. And that's really barely without mentioning the actual stuff that happened on the AI space. Obviously funding, sure, but so much stuff also is just happening there. So it's natural to wonder what is going to happen in 2025 and beyond. So in this video, we're going to talk about predictions that I have for the data world in 2025. And my real question always is, you know, not, not just what tools will dominate the market, but what outcomes will they drive? Especially as I'm talking to more and more organizations that are getting pressured to deliver more with less. Let's talk about what it looks like in 2025 in my five key predictions. So one, let's start with the fact that Iceberg uh, will cement its stronghold. Sort of. That is to say that in a perfect world, right, like companies will use Iceberg as kind of their central data store as a standard, right? Like everyone can use it as a standard. I realized in my newsletter, I accidentally said they purchased Iceberg when I'm like, I meant to say tabular. How did no one call me out on that immediately? I don't know. I'm sure someone will by the time this video comes out. And for many organizations, if they can centralize their data platform around Iceberg, it will be a game changer. It will make managing, processing their data considerably easier. But here's the thing that I also know, and this is why I kind of say sort of. There are a lot of companies out there that don't want to stitch together multiple tools just to get similar features and functionality that current data warehouses and platforms have out of the box, right? Some people just want to use Snowflake as is without having to go down the route of wondering, you know, what's this other table? Can I just use standard tables? I've literally talked to people um, and talked to directors and VPs who have told me things like we just like skiing on the weekends and we don't want to sit there and babysit um, a system that someone's kind of cobbled together. And, you know, if someone quits, that will be what ends up happening. So some people are very much in the world of I would prefer not spending time tinkering. I just want something that works out of the box. I don't want to take five or six tools and stitch them together. And the truth is people in the tech world have different priorities. Some people love, again, skiing on the weekends. Other people want to spend all weekend tinkering and playing with tools. And both of them exist, you know, before someone says, hey, the people who don't tinker won't be around. If they can drive business results, they'll be around. They will be leading teams. And of course, some people are a hybrid where they like trying to do a little bit of both. So that's why in some cases it'll work great in the terms of iceberg. In other cases, it'll just be a struggle to get companies to centralize on one singular data format. And they'll have like normal and most other companies have 30 different tools they're using. And they'll be using, you know, BigQuery, Redshift, Snowflake, Databricks all under one roof. And they'll kind of look like a smorgasbord of tooling where the marketing team has one, the sales team is using another tool. And so there's no real consistency, especially at large enterprises that struggle to adopt solutions uh, throughout all their various entities that get cut and sold off and merged and reacquired and so on and so forth. And so all these tools kind of just get thrown around. Next, I'm going to say SQL isn't going anywhere. And the reason I'm going to say this is because I just know someone out there is tempted to revive uh, Data Lake 1.0, which was just basically a data swamp. That's what we called it. We'll just get all this unstructured data, shove it into a single place and put a layer on top of it and do schema on read. That's what we called it for everyone who has never heard that term. That's what we called it. We called it scheme on read. We'll just figure it out when we write the query. And that's kind of what I feel like people are going to start suggesting we do now is this undeterministic approach of like, hey, we have all this data. We'll just run an LLM on top of it and it will give us the right answer. If the data is not well formatted, if it's not structured, if it's not set up in a way that is somewhat usable so that the system and so that the machines can understand it and sure they can infer a lot, but like everyone else, they have their limitations. You're going to run into issues, right? We've seen strange issues already with things like LMs, even with companies as good as Google, you know, and their results, you could probably put up a few examples, whether it's their ability to tell the difference between five sixteenths and three eighths or something else. At this point, we're just accepting the fact that Google now gives us mediocre results. I also recall the time when SQL was dead for what I started. There were tons of SQL is dead articles. Some of that was due to, again, the schema on read approach where we were having to use other query languages to interact with data. Um, or there's all this no SQL that was coming out and all of that kind of made us question, especially if you're new to the industry, hey, where is SQL going? And if anything, it's gotten more prolific in the last decade, especially with tooling that just makes it easier and easier to just use SQL um, instead of also programming. So overall, I think SQL will, re will remain the lingua franca of data, uh, especially as I keep opening up queries that are 5,000 lines, me having to figure out, you know, tons and tons of case statements, tons of crazy joins that you're like, I thought it should just be a basic join. It's not. So as long as that exists, we'll have plenty of time where it's still the way we interact with data. 
Next, I think for the third point, AI is going to go from like a press release driven initiative to real life, meaning we're actually going to start seeing things happen more. And I think this is going to come from companies that have maybe been quieter over the last two years, right? Companies that maybe were like, oh, yeah, we're doing all this AI and we're focused quietly on building reliable data infrastructure around their AI. Now, I do want to call out that a lot of times we're using this term AI and even in that term, it seems to be a very narrow slice of AI where it's like LLMs, AI agents. Companies have been doing AI and machine learning for decades now. So yes, some people already have the infrastructure in place and are doing a great job of implementing models. And other companies are still honestly at a place, I talked to two people in the last few weeks, where they don't even know how they should deploy a model, right? Like they built it, now they're like, I don't know how to deploy it. So you have to build that infrastructure around it to make deployment very easy. So those who are building solid foundations will benefit. I think we're also gonna see on the other side, AI use cases expanding, and I'm talking to certain companies, such as the company that I've invested in, Row.ai, who are actually solving really interesting problems using things like LLMs for larger companies. And even the use cases they're talking about, it's like, they just seem so real, right? Can't always talk about them, but we're gonna start seeing these more unique use cases, I think really explode somewhere in like 2027. It takes time for this stuff to go from just proof of concept to full deployment. So I think it's gonna take some time, uh, but I think that's around where it's gonna hit. Otherwise, a lot of what I've heard is some of the same things I heard a decade ago. Like we've heard a lot more about, hey, AI can figure out how we can use pharmaceuticals differently. And it's not to say that it doesn't, but we've been talking about that for a decade plus, if not probably more before I got in the data world. Similarly, I remember reading articles about what's better at forecasting uh, neural networks or RIMA modeling. And you know, it just feels like there's a lot of repeat ideas that are coming. So really, I think who's going to win are people who can figure out actual use cases for this tool versus just applying the same kind of first or second layer of ideas that we've been thinking about for a long time. For the next prediction uh, of where the data world's going, I think we're gonna continue chasing the same holy grails we always have. I wrote a whole article about the holy grails that we have uh, in the data world. We're always trying to run for the single source of truth. We're always trying to run for, you know, self-service analytics. There's certain things that we're chasing and some companies have gotten to or at least gotten to a state that's closest to it but some companies are just so far from there right even using things like databricks genie ai when i used it with josue you know if you see our video together which is on this channel we had a whole moment where you know the query that it ran wasn't exactly right and if josue didn't understand sql and couldn't read it he wouldn't have been able to instruct essentially the agent to do the proper next steps and so asking a non-technical person to interact with this layer wouldn't have worked and so even things like self-service analytics is just always almost there, but just never perfectly there for the tooling. Um, it's really going to be about, you know, how do we put the processes around it to make it easier for people to work with, get the right information, and then also just defining what these terms mean for each of our companies. So when your company is going for self-service analytics, if you really want to get there, you have to define what it means ahead of time. Kind of like, what would you want to check off? You know, does it mean certain persona? So like analysts can access the data and build whatever they need. Does it mean a VP can do that? who's going to do that and what can they do? Can they build a dashboard? Can they write queries against the data? Where's the cutoff and who is the person that is, is working with it? You know, be able to answer those questions when you're building these holy grails. And the thing that's holding a lot of these holy grails back is a lot of the same thing. We're lacking data governance, we're lacking data quality. Uh, we often sometimes are sped through data modeling and just a general misalignment in terms of what the business needs and what they're saying and what the data team is doing. All right, so five for my final prediction, I think we're gonna see a lot more vertical specific data solutions and tooling. So we built all these tools that are very general, right? There's the mad data landscape, there's tons and tons of tooling that exist, but they're all really just picks, right? Like none of them are put together in such a way that specific verticals could take them and immediately find value, right? Like you have to build up the data model, you have to build up your API connectors, all of this stuff by yourself. I think we're gonna see more tooling and more solutions that try to wrap everything together and then maybe just deliver for a very specific industry. So like healthcare, uh, there's the Tuva Health Project or Tuva Project that's trying to make it very easy to create a model, like a single set of models and metrics around healthcare, especially around like claims and insurance. It, it does things like ingest data, it has like DBT models. They put it on top of different data platforms like Snowflake or Databricks. And all of that is focused on healthcare. And they have a pretty cool, I think, project or idea, especially someone who has dug into healthcare I think that idea of building more vertical specific data solutions makes a lot of sense because why are we rebuilding the same stuff over and over again when we could hopefully just have all these tools and make it build the exact thing we need, right? If we want a sales uh, set of entities, if we want a marketing kind of data warehouse and reporting, if we want healthcare reporting and metrics, like why can't we have that all 
out of the box. Wrapping all this up, you know, a key takeaway is that change happens slowly. It doesn't happen overnight, right? Things take time. We're going to have small improvements that happen, right? We're going to have these massive changes all at once and then small improvements on that change that will slowly get us somewhere, so, right? We had uh, the release of ChatGPT that got everyone focused on uh, LLMs. So now everyone's going to keep building and building. And the people that are really trying to struggle through the problems we're running through in LLMs and not being like, oh, they don't work, are the ones that are going to slowly figure out uh, in the next five years how to make them actually work. And we still have the same problems that we're always dealing with. You know, we have data quality issues. We have process issues. And those are things that are far harder in many ways to solve. And an LLM on top of everything won't just solve it. So I do think there will be plenty of changes in the next five or 10 years. I think for the next five or 10 years, if you're looking to go into data, I think you'll be fine. There's a lot of work to do. There's a lot of messy data, messy queries. Like if anything, if you're worried about work, there's probably more work than you want to deal with. So good luck to anyone who's starting their data career now. And I hope to see you in the next video. Thanks all. Goodbye.